Now, the debate over the news coverage of the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine is continuing. Global networks such as BBC and CNN have suspended reporting in Russia to protect their journalists. This comes after the global distributor of Russia state-backed channel RT, formerly known as Russia Today, stopped providing that feed to many uh, uh, platforms, including South Africa's multi-choice, and that was last week. I'm joined by international journalist Paula Slier, coming to us live from Moscow in Russia this afternoon, just to discuss this and other related matters. Paula, it's good to talk to you, and thank you very much uh, for your time. Can I begin just with a general question, Paula? What are Russia's mainstream media saying about what's happening in Ukraine? Because here in South Africa, like everywhere else, I guess, in other parts of the world, we're just getting bombarded with just Western media media coverage. Well, this is exactly the problem, and this is why it was so sad that Russia Today was part of the sanctions imposed by the international community, because Russia Today was translating into English what the mainstream media here in Russia is saying in Russian. It's very much a narrative that supports the Russian government's point of view. There are a lot of reasons that we don't necessarily have the time to go in now as to why Russia launched what it calls a military operation in Ukraine. And, and hence the, 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 the mainstream information coming across in Russia is, of course, the losses that are being incurred. And people here are terribly upset by the pictures and the images that are coming out of Ukraine. But there is, and here the population is divided, but I want to say that there is a sizable percentage of the Russian population who still supports this military incursion in Ukraine. They believe that it is necessary in, in terms of helping to defend the pro-Russian Ukrainians who live in the east of the country. It's necessary to stop the expansion of NATO that the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has been warning the international community against for a long time, saying that Russia is concerned about this. And, and there's a host of other reasons that Russia has launched this operation. Now, in terms of headlines, in terms of news, how is Russian media reporting on this? You've said that there are images coming through that are upsetting many people there. But what is the media telling its audiences, the various Russian media? Well, let me preface my answer by saying there's a big problem because Russian journalists are banned from going to Ukraine. So I myself, I would rather be in Kiev right now than in Moscow, but I have another two years on my ban that was slapped on me by the Ukrainian government the last time I was in the country. So the Ukrainian government sees anybody that works for a Russian state media outlet as a propagandist or a Putin information warrior. Those are the kind of terminologies they use. So at this point in time, there are no Russian journalists in the part of Ukraine that the majority of the fighting is happening. Russian journalists have been limited to the east of Ukraine, which is where I reported from during the last war which is the reason that, or part of the reason that Putin gives for launching the war this time, and that is the part of Ukraine that is pro-Russia. So when it comes to what is happening in Kiev and other big centers where we see the Russian military operating, they're having to rely on on independent sources, if you can say there is such a thing during a war. Of course, a lot of people are not only accessing the Russian media, there are a lot of people using online platforms. And in this respect, there is a lot of information coming across from various sources. The Russian media does say that the Ukrainians are exaggerating the number of losses that are being experienced by the Russians. They insist that the Russian army is targeting military sites. And of course, we've all seen the pictures of the high civilian count. The Russian government has a view that the Ukrainians are very often using civilians as human shields. At the same time, they also are discouraging NATO and Western countries from sending weapons into Ukraine, saying that this is just going to inflame the conflict, that really they want to see the military installations that they say are responsible for firing at pro-Russians living in Ukraine for the last eight years. They want to have those wiped out, and then they will feel as if their operation has succeeded. Let me just mention, though, that there's also a blackout on information in terms of coming out of Russia. You mentioned it in your intro. And here there is a, a law that's been passed. A journalist can 
face up to 15 years if they are caught reporting what is called fake news about Russia. Now, this does sound draconian. The justification from the Russian side is that there's an information war on the go. And in the same way that Russia today has been turned off outside of Russia because Western powers feel that it's a propaganda tool that purports and only reports on the Russian government's point of view, they feel the same in terms of Western media exaggerating the situation and not accurately reflecting what is happening on the ground. So it's very unfortunate both sides that you have the the turning off on media. I mean, I wouldn't support it, whether it's Russia Today, CNN, independent media, government media, I don't think it matters. I think people should be able to access all media and make up their own point of view. I think we all agree on that. I mean, it's all around, it's all about, as I always tell people, around fair reporting and as accurate as possible and hearing all views and getting all views to, to, to be aired. Did I understand you uh, uh, correctly there, Paula? I might not have. Please correct me. As much as Europe has now blocked the distribution of Russia to date, or RT rather, to the rest of the world, including here, uh, multi choice in South Africa, you said the Russian authorities are also blocking media from outside of Russia, the Western media. Have they done that as well? No, no. So, so let me explain it. It was um, with, with the introduction of this law, you had a number of international officers here in Moscow that have suspended the operations because they're nervous that if they report something later, the Russian government could turn around and say, well, we're charging you because that actually wasn't factually correct. So there is a suspicion from the international networks in terms of why the Russian government is doing this and, and whether they're putting their journalists at risk. So you have, for example, CNN and Bloomberg, BBC, ABC, CBS News, Canadian networks, they have voluntarily closed down on their own. But Russia has stopped the broadcast of Voice of America and Deutsche Welle. And you do have at the same time a number of independent stations here who feel that with this new law being put into place that they can't um, continue broadcasting. So I think what we're witnessing is this, this disparity that you're getting here in Russia, one particular point of view, and you're getting in the Western world a different point of view. For example, for years now, Russian media has been blocked from Ukraine. So the Ukrainians have, I mean, they, they have no access to how Russians perceive this war, what Russians think of this war, and that's already been a situation for years. So I, I think the point is that we can't have select media. We, we have to understand that we live in a world in which information war is very, very real. And I think the way to fight information war is by understanding and being open to all points of view. For example, mm -hmm. Russia today is the government of view. You might, you might disagree with it, but I think it's valuable knowing what is the Russian point of view and how they justify this yeah. war. I mean, so, I, mean, yeah. I mean, for some of us, like, like me, I mean, I was, I was consuming RT since the war started and then it just went away on, 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 as a subscriber to, to, to multi-choice. Because of the work you do, you want to get uh, all sides and understand. As you correctly say, you might not agree with, uh, with whatever uh, the position is being, is being espoused, but you need to understand it. So when you engage on the matter, you're getting all, all, all views across. Now, the, the other point, you've mentioned fake news. And the Russians have passed a law, you said, that that has made international media networks very nervous and to stop reporting uh, and stuff like that because there's this law now that you're not sure if you might face charges uh, afterwards because of your, of, of your reports. But there's also, re I don't know, where there's the other aspect of social media fake news. I mean, you, we are getting all kinds of visuals on, 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 on all kinds of platforms claiming all kinds of things and then being, being shown later not to, to, to have been true. Where you are in Moscow, are you getting a sense of the reality, really, of what is happening? You were saying that uh, some of the Russian uh, media, they are saying the Ukrainians are exaggerating, for example, the extent of the casualties and the damage that's being done. So we are so far away. But is it, uh, that phenomenon of social media fake news happening there as well? Of course, it's massive here. I mean, you have Russian Facebook. In fact, in the last two days, there have been moves by the Russian government to shut down Facebook and to shut down Twitter as well. 
You see, you have a very real problem, and I think it's not just a problem that Russia and Ukraine are facing in this war. I think you recognize the problem that all of us journalists have been facing for a long time, and I think we have to find ways to deal with it moving forward, and that is the problem of fake news. I think as, as a journalism industry, we're going to be doing less about breaking news and more about verifying news, because, of course, there's a lot of images that are coming across that actually turn out not to be true in the end. And so... The Russian government, many will say, has gone too far by introducing a potentially 15-year jail sentence. But they're trying to deal with this problem as well of fake news because there are rumors going around here, and this is information that's coming from Western media, that the number of Russian soldiers who have been killed is much higher than the Russians are reporting. Now, the Russian government perceives this as fake news because they believe it's an effort by the other side to demoralize Russians and to demoralize Russian soldiers. Now, we have no way of independently confirming how many soldiers have been killed. And I think we need to be careful as journalists. We need to attribute who gives the figures. So we can say the Russian defense ministry has a record that so many have died. The Ukrainians say so many have died. But that's when you start coming into trouble because there's so much information changing all the, all the time. I mean, there were reports that um, in the last week, BBC Turkey was showing footage that as it had actually been from two years before. We had something with the Ukrainian army tweeting something about a, a, a massive fight in the sky that actually came from a game. So the problem is that there's, there's the, the competition to be the first with the story. There's the, the competition to be dramatic. There's no time to verify this information. And so this is a problem that everybody faces. The Russians are facing, the Ukrainians are facing. Now, the Russians have chosen to deal with it by saying, well, we are going to impose this ban. The international community has chosen to deal with it potentially by closing down Russian channels. I don't think either is a valid solution. I think we need to find other ways of verifying mm. news. But I don't think closing platforms, regardless of what the platforms are, or making journalists afraid to work, I don't think any of that is a way to deal with the problem. Yeah, and certainly, as you said, banning uh, a, a, a broadcaster like RT from reaching uh, other places in the world or pulling the plug on them, so to speak, is not a solution either. Uh, but now, finally, uh, Paula, uh, uh, on the ground, uh, from where we are now today, in terms of the news that I've read uh, before I spoke to you, is that uh, the humanitarian corridors that they've been appealing for by the United Nations have been opened, and that there's a resumption of talks, round three, uh, between Ukraine and, and, and Russia. Uh, uh, from where we're sitting, where you are sitting rather in Moscow, what's the latest sort of update, if you are able, as we conclude, to give us, give us a sense of what is really now the main thing that is happening there, sifting through all of this uh, kind of uh, information that sometimes is official, sometimes is unofficial. What's happening today? Well, the talks you refer to are obviously talks between the Ukrainian and Russian side. They were due to happen at 3 o'clock Russian time. They'll happen now in only in an hour's time from now. And that will be in Minsk, in the Belarusian capital. To be honest, neither side seems to be particularly hopeful that the talks are going to bring about anything. Both sides are sticking to their positions. For example, Russia insists that the Ukrainians must lay down arms, and the Ukrainians are not going to do that. So that's Russia already saying, well, we're not going to be party to the talks. The sense one gets is that the Russians have a military campaign that they want to complete, and they're not going to complete that until they finish. Now, there are rumors, and again, let me point out that these are rumors, that the campaign could go on for another three weeks. No way of independently verifying that, and I don't have anybody to attribute that to. The Russians also accuse the Ukrainians of constantly changing the venue and the deadlines for these talks, and they believe that the Ukrainians are looking for excuses so that they can extend the conflict, you might wonder, well, why does it benefit them? The Russians would argue that they get international weapons, they get international support, they're in a stronger position to actually fight the Russians, or they're in a stronger position to argue their NATO case. On the other side, of course, when you see what's happening in Ukraine, people there desperate to get out and for a ceasefire to come into effect as soon as possible. There is a humanitarian corridor that opened earlier today. We, know, we are here in Russia expecting several buses 
to come through with a few hundred Indian students. I know that there were efforts to try and get some South Africans on those buses because I've been in touch with the South Africans coordinating that and they were not allowed on the buses for no other reason than an administrative problem. So there are still foreigners who are stuck in Ukraine who are desperately trying to get out of Ukraine. We will need to see further humanitarian corridors, but the problem is that they keep breaking down when the talks break down. And, and so you have the potential that you're risking a person's life when you put them on a bus and send them through a humanitarian corridor and that humanitarian corridor doesn't necessarily last. And the last point to make is that people are starving. There are stepped up efforts to try and get food to people. And I'm talking here, the, the Ukrainians who support Russia, there's food coming across from the Russian side, the Ukrainians who don't support Russia, which is the majority of the country, and that is where most of the fighting seems to be happening, certainly now, and there are efforts to try and get food to that part of the country. So the sense on the ground is that we're a long way from over, and not only will the conflict continue, but unfortunately this information warfare will also continue, and maybe my appeal to listeners and viewers is just to sift through all the information. There's a lot of disinformation going around. It's often and very hard to verify what is true and what is not true. I would say take everything with a grain of salt, even pictures. You know, even pictures can be doctored, even pictures are being used from years before. I'm not detracting from the conflict. I think this is a horrendous conflict. I think it ex is extremely unfortunate what's happening. But we just need to become more discerning as viewers in terms of how we consume our media. Paula Slea, thank you. Thank you so much for your insights and your time coming to us here on ENC Live from Moscow in Russia.